Thanks for joining us online. We really are grateful for the opportunity to be able to connect with you. Whether you're a regular here at LBCC, perhaps you're another follower of Jesus and you're just stopping in to see what we're doing, or maybe you're a person who's curious about the teachings of Christianity and the things that Jesus had to say. Our aim is simple as a church. First, we want to connect you, connect you to Jesus, that is, who is the source of all life and goodness. And while we're doing that, we want to connect you to community because community is God's idea and everyone's better off when they're with other people. Secondly, we want to help you grow as a person. People are meant to grow. We're meant to improve and learn and grow and mature as people. When you grow in your relationship with God, it becomes dynamic and changes your life. When you grow in relationships with other people, it helps you have a full life and purpose in life. That brings me to the third aim. Our third aim is to help you invest your life in something bigger than yourself. Everyone knows that, that if we look inward, we often get lost and lose our moorings. But it's the people that take their lives and, and do something with it, invest in something way bigger than themselves, that know that they have purpose and meaning in their life. Of course, the gospel is the greatest thing you can invest your life into. It's a, it's a mission, it's a, a goal that goes well beyond you. But you should also be investing in your family, in your town, in your, any place in your community you can. When you do these three things, connect, grow, and invest, your life is on the kind of track that it should be. Thank you again for joining us online. Here are some of the ways you can connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings of every month. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Also, check out our life groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some meet in person, others on Zoom, either weekly or a couple of times a month. Of course, visit our website or call the office at 732-870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now here's today's sermon. Let me back up a step and say, just say, you know, we're, this study, I think, personally, I think this is probably one of the most important ones, series that we've ever even thought about doing, and it's over 20 weeks, which is, as you know, almost half a year that we'll spend in that, and probably stretch it out a little bit. And th there's a title that we've put on it, is Finding Your Place in God's Big Story. And... Uh, <clears throat> I've used that phrase, God made it, we broke it, and Jesus fixed it. And if that is the theme of the scripture, that's what we want to do, is we want to get in to look at the one story that there is in the Bible. And I, next year, just for memory's sake, next year on June 30th will be 50 years that they laid hands on me on the altar on the platform at Salem Gospel Tabernacle, Joanne and me. Save your applause for next year. And one of the, that was after studying the scripture for two years with a group of people every day from eight in the morning till 12 noon. Uh, for two years we did that. I started the summer before and what I learned in that study was how to study the Bible. The one thing I came away from when they asked me, what did this mean to you? I said, I have confidence to find out what the Bible is saying. That I can find, what I learned here was that I could study the scripture and not go off the rails somewhere. That there was enough guardrails and information to get me into the scripture. And I have to say that my pursuit in these 50 years, actually I started preaching the year before, was to, to speak the truth of God. What, what is it that God is saying? And I remember when I passed at Community Gospel Church, I would say that, you know, God is doing something and that God is saying something and he expects us to respond to what he's doing and saying. 
And that's what we have to find out. We have to find out what is God doing and actually what is he saying to us. And especially at this time in our lives, we could say in one sense it's the same thing. We need to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations or all peoples, teaching them them to obey all that Jesus has commanded in the scripture. And we're also to build the church. We are to edify believers. So we could say that everything that that I do, if you want to join in with me, that's fine. It's not, my, it's not original, just so you know. Everything that I do is to, to help the church do those two things. I'm not an evangelist, but I like to evangelize. I love to evangelize. Um, I, I don't see sinners getting saved in the sense of an evangelist. I think they see it happening before it happens. Uh, I may be wrong about that. But I, I love to equip people to do that. I know how to talk to sinners that will help them. But I also know that submitting to the Holy Spirit is perhaps the more important thing than learning how to talk to sinners. Getting off here. <clears throat> so what we want to do is help everyone, ourselves included, is find our place in God's big story. God is doing something. And we have to find out what he's doing and we have to listen, the way that we do that is we listen to what he's, he's saying in what he's doing, and then join in with it. And we find our place. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. This came out of a study that someone did on the phrase, um, Jesus has a plan for your life. In very, very sparse literature before 1960, you may find that phrase somewhere. But it was in the 1960s, that suddenly that phrase emerged. And it was because the 1960s was named, was coined as the me generation. And so all of a sudden, God has a plan for me. No, God has a plan for himself. And we find our place in what God is doing. And that's what we want to do. It isn't about me. It's about God. It's about the revelation of God. We're declaring his excellencies, right? Who, who took us out of the, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his, his son. That's what our job is to do. It's all about him, and we need to understand that. And there's a, a really good book that we have um, picked out, the subject titles. I have to say that I've already changed the title that I have this morning. <clears throat> creativity. But Living God's Word is a, is a good book on understanding this story, what this big story is. Actually, their subtitle was Discovering Our Place in the Great Story of Scripture. And we, we understand how that works when you read this. And I think, Tony, I don't know, did you buy some copies? You have some copies. Or no? <laughs> You gave people the link to buy the copy. That's probably the, the best thing to do. It is a, it's an easy to read book. It's not heavily theological, but it basically explains all the things that go on in the scripture. So that's what we're doing and we're going to look at. So this, this morning, this is creation and crisis. That's our title. And I, as I mentioned already, I changed the title of it. It's creation in crisis. Even though uh, you were, you were, those of you who are on the mailing list were, were asked to read the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and you should be somewhat familiar with that. It's um, a very powerful part. I, I often say, you know, the first three chapters of Genesis give me more questions than any other section in the Bible. And when I start to study these first 11 chapters, that just adds to it. There are just so many questions that I have about those first 11 chapters. And if you're reading the book, they mention a man called John Walton, who's written a series of book, books on, on the lost scripture of Adam, uh, or the lost world of Adam, the lost world of the Old Testament. And John Walton is, a, is an Old Testament scholar, and he has a unique view of things. Some people love him, some people don't. I kind of like him. I think he's really good. I haven't read him enough to, 
really make a, a complete decision about him, but I find that he has a nice perspective of the Old Testament. So we live at a real tumultuous time in our history. Uh, if you're paying any attention to what's going on, you're probably asking what's going on. Some people are saying, how did we get here? There's some value in understanding how we got here. I think there is some, some understanding that'll help us. But we, we live in a time where the rest of the world, this, a lot of what we're going through is not new to the rest of the world. It's just come upon us. And we, we as Americans never thought it would. We thought we had a fail safe. We thought we had a, fireproof, whatever, culture, that it wouldn't happen to us. But in, in some very short years, we've gone from a, 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 an agenda by homosexuals to, to trans people. We, we've gone from something that was just uh, considered uh, a sexual orientation to people looking at gender identity and, and seeing something that is, is we, we would call it, and I know this will probably be out on the internet somewhere, we would call it perverted. That this is a perversion of our humanity. This is a distortion of what God has created. My friend Frank Turek says this, he says the, the, the answer to this whole thing is, you find out your gender by asking the question, can you produce sperm or can you have babies? The whole mammalian gen, gen, genesis or whatever it is, it's all those two things. They either can produce sperm or they can have babies. They don't do both. So it's one or the other. And I think that, that would answer that, and I don't want to get into that. I think sex trafficking um, is something that has come upon us. I'm involved to a very minimal degree, but involved with a group in South Africa that are rescuing women who have been trafficked. And uh, I hope to be able to speak to their team when I return to South Africa. It's a um, huge, huge thing. We're finding out it's very prominent here too. It's just covered up. So we, we see, we, we, we are in crisis mode. And we, we have to start to think like that because what is God doing about that? What is God doing? And we'll look at some scriptures later on and, and see. So I'm, you know, to, to say I'm going to speak about the first 11 chapters in Genesis would take us till probably Friday or Saturday. Um, so the questions that, that are asked in the book is, who am I and what's wrong? Those are the two things that we, we look at, who am I and what is wrong? And we'll look at that to find out as, as humans, what are we? So the first thing we look at is, is who am I? And I would say that, that I am, I'm a human made in God's image. Yeah? I, I'm a human made in God's image. And that would be the most succinct, the, the shortest answer to that, I'm not looking at being moral, not looking at anything else, but there is a difference between between humanity and the rest of the animal kingdom, the, the rest of the created order, because no one else can, can say that. So here, here's a good verse to start with. This is in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves. Let's pray before I get too far down the road with this. Father, we thank you for your love and goodness. We thank you for your presence with us this morning. Thank you for the worship team and for them leading us into your presence. We pray that you would help us, Lord, understand who you are in a greater way as we look at this and see what you're doing in the earth and how we fit into it, how we, how we embrace it, Lord. We thank you for that. We pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to comprehend, hear you, help me to deliver the word, Lord, and 
We'll give you the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. So there it says it all. God made us in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And let me just say this, that when Moses wrote this, obviously he had revelation from God to, to write this. Now, whether this was truth handed down through the ages or this was, was God speaking to Moses on, on Mount Sinai or wherever else God met him and gave him this understanding of it, I believe that what Moses was doing wasn't so much, he's not writing a science book, not writing a history book, He's writing to the other nations around, just to give you some context, that Israel had more in common with the other nations that surrounded them than, he, than, they, had with, than they have with us in the 21st century. They understood their vision of God was more akin to the nations around them than they did anything else. They carried idols with them out of Egypt. Why? If God delivered them in such a magnanimous way with destroying the gods of, of Egypt, why would they carry idols out? Why would they carry them into the promised land? They carried them for 40 years in the wilderness. Joshua has to deal with them when they go into the promised land. They, they were interpreting the things that were going on by the gods of the nations around them. And so what Moses is doing in writing Genesis, he's striking them down again. He's saying that, that the things that you believe about creation and the stories of creation, because all of them had stories of creation, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, um, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Termites, they all had, they all had views of creation. They all had views of how we came to be. So Moses, like many other places in the scripture, God using Moses is setting the picture straight. He's saying, you think this, but here it is right here. So when we read Genesis chapter 1, he's deal, you know, that, that um, sequence of creation doesn't match what we know in the natural order but it, it fits something else. And then why does he start all over again in chapter 2, what we call chapter 2? It's because he, he's embellishing it and telling us something a little bit different. Okay. This is chapter 2, actually the end, of, the end of the creation story. It says, Then the Lord God said, What? It's not good. This is after six days of creation and him saying everything was good. When he first made man, he said it's good. Everything was good, right? Now he looks and he says, it's not good for man to be alone. Now men, just take a picture of this. It didn't say it's not good for women to be alone. He said it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground... The Lord God formed every animal of the field, every bird of the sky, brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the sky, and every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suited for him. Now, I would contest that. Because if Adam had to plow a field, he had a horse. If he needed f food for, for meat, he had sheep, cattle, whatever. So they would have been help for him in the way we would understand help. But you've got to scratch the surface a little bit. What does this word help mean? A helper suitable for him. Here's the traditional way that God needed to help Adam do his job, so he gave him a servant to help. Come on now. Isn't that the way we understand it, though? Okay, so this word helper, what does it mean? 
Let's take a little look. This is a little diversion, I admit. <clears throat> Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Then the man said, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. <clears throat> Sorry. So here's his word, help. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is a refuge and strength, a very help in trouble. So God is a help. Same word. <clears throat> the word is azer, rhymes with razor. <clears throat> yeah? So God is a help. Same kind of help, same word. Use the same way. Hear, Lord, and be gracious to me. Lord, be my Helper, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So this is just to let us know, if there's any, if there's any uh, doubts about it, that this word help would be better translated as an ally. And that's not even, that's not even giving it the full strength of, of the meaning. It is a partner in the task ahead of me. It is someone who shares the responsibility to do what God wants me to do. And here he's, the psalmist is writing for God to be my very help in a time of trouble. Come and help me do what I need to do to get out of this. Lord, be my helper. Be gracious to me. Be my helper. And my help comes from the Lord. My strength comes from the Lord. This is what the woman is to be to the man or with the man, an ally and a partner in filling the earth, in, in being um, fruitful in all the things that God has given to us. So we just lay that one out and say, this is what was supposed to happen. And we know the story that God is, in the, is, is created outside of the garden, but is brought into the garden. And he fellowships with God in the garden. And I'm going to fly over a bunch of scriptures here without having to read all of them. So humanity is, is man and woman created in the image of God, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, if you're taking notes, and it'd be good if you were, if you just look at those words, fruitful and multiply, and just remember them through the scripture, because they're going to show up in the scripture as we go on. So one day, suddenly in the garden, this serpent shows up, and that's the translation of the word um, that we, that we, uh, we see in English. <clears throat> as in a lot of, in a lot of Hebrew, there isn't a really exact word for this because th there's a link between this word serpent and the, and, and the word for cherubim. There, there's a similarity between these two things. So the serpent, like I, I said this a couple of weeks ago, I don't like snakes. I, I have held a couple. Don't do anything for me. And I told the story, I was doing some gardening work outside in front of my house when I first moved to North Carolina. I was planting a bush, and I was, had a small hoe in my hand, and I was digging up the soil, and suddenly there was about an eight-inch worm. Hmm. <laughs> and before I could look at it twice, I hacked its head off. That was my normal response. So that's my, that's my view of snakes. I never... <clears throat> I didn't, didn't even look say, oh, what kind of snake is it? Well, maybe I can make a pet out of it. My daughter would have. She would have thought we could have this live in the house with us and feed it mice every day or whatever else it's going to eat. No. So this serpent, this being shows up in the garden and starts to have a conversation with Eve. And I'm not going to go through all of it. I do want to look at the curse later on and see how how that fits in. But he, here's, here's the thing to remember. What, what, the de what did the devil say to Eve? Has God said? Now what's implied in that? Can God be trusted? And that is the root of all disobedience. Yeah, very simple. Has God said? Is God really going to keep his promise? Is God going to do what he said? Is God going to be? Is he going to do this? Is he going to show up? Is he never going to leave me? Is God going to get me out of every mess I get in? I can tell you right now, no. 
You're going to go through some messes, whether you like it or not. But here it is. It, it's the root of all disobedience. Has God said? And traditionally what happens is, you know the story, right? They go back and forth. Eve doesn't exactly quote what God said. She says he's not even supposed to touch this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which, again, it's so hard to just get by this. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil basically is who decides what's good and evil? Does God decide or do we decide? That, that really is what it is. Do we, do we determine what's right in life and what's wrong in life? Or does God do it? So has God said? And again, traditionally, we call this the fall because they believed a lie. I like to think of it more like an expulsion. They got expelled because of it. And it wasn't so much, in my mind anyway, this is the way I think about this. What is it a fall from? It's a fall from grace. I don't know if that was true at the time. They, they were expelled from the presence of God. Yeah? Disobedience caused them to be expelled. And I've said this before, that they, they were forced out of the garden. God drove them from his presence. He just didn't say, there's the door, get out. It says he drove them out from his presence. And when they're out of the presence of God, uh, the first thing that happens, Eve has two more sons, and in amount of years that go by, as Cain and Abel, they have a dispute over offerings that they've given, and what happens? Cain rises up and kills the other son, kills Abel. And you could see it's just tumultuous from that time on. It's, it's downhill from there. Everything from the, the people that are going on until you come to a man called Noah. And Noah, Noah gives us a little bit of different, different perception. Here's what the scripture says in chapter 6. It says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of mankind, that the law, wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that every intent of the hearts of their hearts was only evil continually. Now, we don't know the time span. We could probably try to judge how long it was, but we don't know the, the, the time span that happened. But in those first six chapters of, 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 of Genesis, you go from God looking at creation, saying, this is good, this is good, this is good, and now he's saying that the wickedness of mankind is so great on the earth, every intent of their hearts was only evil continually. Then the Lord said, I will wipe out mankind who I have created from the face of the land, mankind and the animals as well, and crawling things and the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. And he says this, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. So right in the midst of that judgment, here's redemption. Now remember, I didn't say this earlier, but the, the quote before that um, was when Eve sinned and God shows up, he tells the, the devil, you're cursed because of this. I saved it on my phone. He said, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat the days, all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The woman has significant judgment placed on her. Adam has judgment placed on him. But it's this one where he talks about, again, there is judgment, and then there's this glimmer of hope. And that's, this is what you're going to see throughout all of the Scripture. He says, <clears throat> Noah walked with God. And we know the story there. I can't go into the whole flood story. I'm going somewhere with this, okay? Stay with me. <clears throat> the Tower of Babel, this is what they said. 
the nations come together, or the people come together. They weren't nations. He says, then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks, bricks and fire them thoroughly. He says, and they use brick for stone. What does God say to do when you're making an altar? No tools on the stone. So they're right from the start, they're going the wrong way. And they used tar for mortar. And they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. And here, here's the bad part about that. I mean, it's all bad. But this is what, let us make a name for ourselves. In other words, it's not God that this is about. Let's make a name for ourselves. You think, <clears throat> sorry. Got to remember, this is 11 chapters. I've been working on this for a few weeks now. There's like a thousand pages of notes in my brain right now. <clears throat> Doing all right? So this is going to just continue to, through the scripture. Do you, you ever realize that all the stories in the Bible, how they had other gods that they worship, but was that entertainment for them? What was that for them? Where was all, there was no sports teams. There was no, 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 no reason to be divided over whether you were a Jets or a Giants fan. Or eagles, oh. Sorry, I'm still not plugged into the Northeast. <clears throat> but you think about it. They, they didn't have any of this stuff that we have today, and there's so much of it. And I think you could put this little phrase underneath all of them. Whatever it is, whether it's in entertainment or in sports, or whatever thing that is keeping them from the presence of God is let us make a name for ourselves. Wouldn't that be true? That's really what they all want to do. They want to make a name for themselves. And this is, this is not new. This is as old as all of biblical history is. That the sin of man wants to rise up and be God. Okay, so... This, this ends up in, in chapter 11 of Genesis. But the commentary, I believe, on these first 11 chapters could be found in the New Testament. <clears throat> yeah, I would go here, chapter 1 of Romans, and says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Now I could park right here and deal with this. Because this is a commentary before Noah. Is it? The wrath of God was revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of truth of people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That word suppress is not, doesn't mean it erases it. It's kind of like if you were hiding in a big uh, garbage pail and someone was sitting on the cover, they would suppress you from getting out. And that's the way the enemy treats the truth. He can't get rid of it, so he suppresses it tries to hide it behind other things, starts to call good evil and evil good, starts to change the definition of words, words that have anchored us for, for centuries in our culture. Suddenly they're becoming different words. They're reinventing meanings for words to where you could have your truth and I can have my truth and, and refute any idea that says this is the truth. Because now we shame people by calling them arrogant if they say they have the truth. But they don't realize that they're also declaring they have the truth, that you can't have the truth. Yeah? This is, this is, you could say amen every now and then. This is, this is good stuff.
Paul doesn't stop there. He says this, for the, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now that word, that phrase, without excuse, is the word anapologia. So we get the word apologetics, where it is declaring the truth or defending the truth, this one just puts an Anna before it, which negates it. So they are without an argument. They have no excuse for what they're doing. There are some people today that are trying to give God another attribute. They call it the hiddenness of God. And I've got into a couple of conversations with people and say, that is not an accurate view of God. God doesn't hide himself the way that you may read something in the scripture. They're really talking about, I don't feel the presence of God or I don't see God doing in my life. But this scripture tells me the opposite. It tells me that his invisible attributes and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. So whether God, I, I you know, judge that God isn't doing anything in my life doesn't negate any of these things. And I don't think you can attribute this idea that God is hiding himself. He's just not making himself known. All you've got to do is go outside and look at creation and you could see God's still at work. He's still here. And God does more behind my back than he does in front of my face. That's been my experience with God. God surprises me. He just shows up and I think like, where have you been? And he, I've been doing something all along. You just haven't seen it or known it. Or maybe you haven't been paying attention to the right things. The seeing that God is doing it. Here he says, since the creation of the world, since how long? This is Genesis chapter 1. In everything God did, he was making himself known. His eternal power, divine nature, that's his morality. His holiness has been cl clearly seen, clearly perceived, being understood by that which is made. So there isn't any excuse. And then he says this. He says, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their reasonings and in their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible mankind, of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. This is scary stuff. Even though they knew God, even though they could see God, they don't honor him as God. Now listen, none of these passages mention Jesus. It's all just talking about the person of God himself. And we're living in a time right now where they, this is exactly what they're doing. They're not honoring God as God or giving thanks, and they're becoming futile in their reasonings and speculations. Their senseless hearts are dark, and people ask me, how can they believe that? I'll tell you why they, they can't believe that. Because God gave them over. This is what Paul says. He says, he gave them over to the vile impurity in lusts of their hearts. See, when you, when you start to decide you know what's right better than God knows what's right, it's not like God is at 100% and you're at 90%. No, it doesn't work like that. It's like God is facing north and you start facing south. You're going completely opposite to what God is and who God is. You're not going a little bit off, and, and we're pretty good at this. You know, we, we understand life a little bit better than most. No, it's when we start to think that we can tell God, back up, we don't need you right now. And what happens is they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And this is what's happening in our culture today. They have, they have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. You can say, well, America was, was founded on these principles of, of Christianity. True, I believe all of that. And it's not without its warts and pimples and, and without its mistakes and atrocities and things that happened in the past. But we can never replace the
the divine intervention of God for our smarts. And start thinking, we've come far enough to where we understand how to do this. That is pride to the nth. It's an abomination in the sight of God. And, and if we subscribe to that, we're never going to get out of this. We're never going to be the salt and light. We're never going to be the city on a hill. We're never going to be the lamp on a bushel. We're just going to be a bunch of do-gooders who are trying to get other people to do good with us. What we need is the presence of God in our midst. We need the manifestation of God being with us and God acting through us. That's what we need. What's happened to the world, you can sum it up in all these things. God gave them over to these vile impurities and the lust of their heart. In Romans chapter 1, there's three things that, it's, that Paul says that God gave them over to. Does this sound familiar? Degrading passions. Now we can look back on the Romans and think, boy, they were really like licentious, lustful animals. Look around. Look around. You can hardly turn on a movie today without seeing something that will make your skin crawl a little bit, give you a knot in your stomach, make your, your eyes bleed a little bit because of, of what men kissing men, women kissing women. I'm going to catch crap for this. I'm sorry. Listen, I fear God more than I fear people. I fear more what he'll do to me than what people will do to me. Yeah, and that's why I'll say this to you rather than withhold it. Because I hear God saying this. And I'll say it to all people. I'm not afraid to say there's only two genders. And they're designated by biology. That's right. If you were made a man, just enjoy that. If you were made a woman, enjoy that too. But giving them over to, to degrading passions. But listen, it gets worse. See, your heart leads you. Oh, I do what I feel like I need to do. Well, God gives you that, and he gives you over to degrading passions, and then he gave them up to a depraved mind. And you could see the downward spiral or the step, stair steps that just go downward. That you have these things here that the, these these unnatural things that go on in, in our lives. And folks, it's in our culture. It's in our culture. And we might have a bubble around us that keeps us from, from being touched or touching this stuff. But let me tell you this, it's coming our way. It's already finding its way through our computers, through our televisions, but it's coming our way in person too. We're already finding that, that, that when we... In our, in our school libraries, I heard this on, a, on, a, on a, a message that was preached somewhere else, that you find out that if you bring the library books to the school board and read it to them, what you found in the school library is of such a pornographic nature that the school board tells you you can't do that in public because it's offensive but it's in the library of children in our schools. Now think about that. Think about it. We're putting it out there for the kids to read, but the adults can't read, can't listen to it. Depraved minds. Help us, Lord. And this starts with just ex exchanging the truth of God for a lie. When you do that, you worship and serve a creature rather than a creator. I, I've read Romans, I don't know how many times in my life. I got so upset with these verses because I just saw how they hit home to us. This is what Paul writes in verse 29. He says, people having been filled with all unrighteousness, listen, Wickedness, greed, and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceitful, and malice, 
They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil. I feel like I'm watching the news. Disobedient to parents. Imagine he throws that in there. Besides being deceitful, full of malice, gossip, slanders. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, unmerciful. Paul is painting this picture for the Jews and the, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians in, in the city of Rome. He's writing this to them to understand this is what, what, what has gone on. He's painting just a masterpiece of understanding these things. And you realize today that he wrote it to them, but he wrote it for us. That when we see what's going on in the world, this is not the 1950s anymore. It's not the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, or first 10 years of the 2000s. This is the 21st century. And we're living in, in this really in our lives today. And we're the church, yeah? <clears throat> Chapter 11 of Genesis Again, when you, when you see the way it, it is written, just the masterpiece of it. That built the Tower of Babel, deciding to make a name for themselves, God scatters them on the earth so that they can't do what they think they can do. And it starts out by talking about the genealogy of Shem, who is one of the three sons of Noah. And he ends up with a man called Abram. Who's Abraham become? The father of the faithful. So even in all of this sin and wickedness, he's pointing to the hope. A seed is going to come. We'll look at that next week. We'll look at Galatians, where Paul clearly says, not the seeds, the seed. Singular. It's Jesus that's coming in all of this. Now, what do we do today? We cry out to God and ask God to be merciful to us, first of all, and then to use us for his glory. Find our place in his purpose. Listen, God loves these sinners. Jesus died for these sinners. He died for these people who have depraved minds and are without excuse. Yeah? And we can, we can choose to have a holy huddle and just hang on until the end. Or we can choose to see what God is doing to reach these people. What do we need to do? Here's the question. What do I need to change to be more a part of what God is doing? What's keeping me from being an active participant in the body of Christ? Yeah? I ask myself that question all the time. What can I do better than what I'm doing now? How much more submitted can I be to, to God's will in my life? today? What do I need to do to become more useful? One of my grandkids said to me, because I sent her a paper that I had written, she said, how do you get so much knowledge in your brain? I said, very simple, I read a lot, honey. I'm always reading stuff, listening to it, getting it there, trying to hone my abilities and my skills better to understand the truth more clearly. Yeah. My heart for Long Branch Covenant Church is that we would be willing participants in the plan of God and continue in it. Yes. That we would find whatever it is that God wants. I'm here for. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. <clears throat>
Let me just play that or see that last verse. <clears throat> Terah took his son Abram, Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson and his daughter-in-law Sarai, and his son Abram's wife, and they departed together from Ur, the Chaldeans, to go to the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. Sorry, I thought I finished. <clears throat> you think about this. They're just going from one country to the next. They had no idea what was going to happen with Abraham. They had no idea. He was just the son of Terah. Not Terah, T-E-R-R-O-R, -R, but Terah, T-E-R-A. They had no idea what it was. And when I read that the other day, I thought, I used to drive a cab in New York City. I had no idea that I'd be traveling to South Africa. I had no idea. Guyana, all those other places. England had an infinitum. I mean, I had 80-something stamps in my passport for England alone. I had no idea. You have no idea what God's going to use you with, use you for. And this is personal, but it's also collective, because every decision you make will, will affect every other person in Long Branch Covenant Church. Right? Every one of us, every decision we make is going to affect everybody else in the church. Father, thank you for your love and goodness. Thank you for this time this morning. We look forward to how you're going to continue to reveal yourself to us and what your plan is. Your plan for what you're doing, God, and how we as individuals and as we as Long Branch Covenant Church can fit into it. For that, we give you the praise and the glory. Help us, Lord, to not ever think we need to make a name for ourselves, but that we are committed continually to make your name great. We want Jesus to be seen for who he is, the Savior of the world, God. Your Son, we want this to be with us, God. Fill us afresh with your spirit, Lord. Pour out your spirit on us and fill us afresh. We want to be like the psalmist said. We want to open our mouths wide that you might fill us, Lord. We'll give you the praise for it and the glory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.